OK, well, let's get to the substance of why we're having this special board meeting today. Uh, we've received a lot of valuable material on climate change at previous board meetings, including the um, recent inter intergovernmental panel on climate change report this year. Uh, we have also uh, commissioned a report from our lawyers and uh, at the conclusion of their paper, which they framed in relation to the sole purpose test and APRA's risk appetite statement requirements, it was that the board has latitude to implement investment policies that protect investors from risks such as these, as climate change, if this is for a proper purpose and is in the interests of our members. We've also had information from our asset consultant scoping out the performance track record of investment uh, management products that address climate change, uh, climate change issues and opportunities. I believe as a board we're in general agreement on where we are currently, that we've been diligent in forming ourselves as a board and uh, we're agreed that we should now, having discussed it at previous meetings, determine a proper course of action. So uh, we have in the agenda before mm. us uh, to talk through uh, six or seven issues that we have identified that cover policy, policy implementation, investment strategy, timeframes, investment allocation, measurement and communication. Now these are set out in about seven resolutions. I want to bring to everyone's attention that as we discuss these matters that will be put before us today, we all need to bear in mind that there are certain clear implications for the executive, tasks they'll have to carry through on your behalf. So we might have to change our strategic asset allocation. We may have to review the way we appoint managers. We may have to look at other consultants who can help us with the work that we do. We have to recognise that when we do anything as radical as what we're proposing to do today, there will almost certainly be implications for short-term performance. Or to put it pessimistically, there could be long periods of short-term underperformance compared to our peers. The only thing radical would be to uh, decide to ignore science. That would be a radical thing to do. So, apart from that, I agree, but radical, I don't think that's what's proposed. Okay. I think we need to bear in mind, though, that the average uh, balance of our members is about forty thousand dollars. We're not looking after people who, you know, are looking forward to the most secure <laughs> retirements. Um, I think our focus has to be on investment returns, and that's going to be our primary focus. And I'd be very anxious if um, the investment committee and the investment team are thinking that this is going to be an excuse for short-term underperformance because I think that we have to be looking for opportunities as well. Um, and so I hope, John, you and your team will, will be looking at this as an opportunity to maintain and improve our performance over the medium, short term, as well as the long term. Perhaps if we move on to the substantive issues and maybe if we group resolutions one and two together just for discussion. And the first one is um, in relation to policy that we uh, explicitly address climate change in the fund's statement of investment beliefs as a long-term systemic risk. And the second is in terms of implementation, that we should receive an annual update from the Investment Committee on how the investment um, implications of climate change are implemented. So perhaps if I open that one for discussion, um, Jeff, do you have comments uh, on this? I don't want all of a sudden climate change to be our sort of hot button issue that all of a sudden all of our focus just is narrowly um, focused around it to the exclusion of other things which I think will impact member returns uh, more than whatever we as a fund do in climate change. It seems to me that while uh, Jeff is quite right to say that there are other issues and some of them in short term may be more important, um, that in no way I think removes the need to to focus on this issue. In the same way, it is a fact of science that uh, we have real, uh, a real international debate around uh, carbon abatement, that policies are being made all the time by all of our trading partners. Uh, that will affect this country and, and the global economy where we also invest. Uh, and of course, it's also uh, true that the world is haltingly uh, but, but clearly moving towards 
pricing one way or another, pricing carbon and greenhouse gases, gases one way or another. So it would be, you know, ludicrous not to include such a matter in uh, a set of beliefs. It's not the only belief, clearly. It's not exclusive to the other beliefs, because beliefs then lead. You look if you, if you if you believe in something, then you will look at the risks and what's behind it, and you work your way through. I think you know, all the other beliefs, you know, currency you mentioned is important. This is important too. So but if it's not explicit in our beliefs, it's very <laughs> difficult then for the investment team to say that's what we should manage our investments to. But once it's there, it's basically saying, besides all the beliefs. Another additional one you have to look at. But our job is to translate beliefs into action. Correct. And I think a theme that will emerge through our discussion today is that there are two paths to take with regard to having a belief in anthropogenic climate change and its deleterious effects. So as a long-term investor, you don't want to be suddenly caught with an asset you've got no buyers or is not trading no longer. So it's really about the risk and returns we're looking at for the future for the member. We're still, I'm like, I'm, I agree with you, uh, we need to ensure that the return and the outcome for members is always good. And this is what we're looking at. This is not at trying to having the members lose money, this is trying to protect their money in their future. And to not have this as a heading in our statement of investment beliefs, um, that the executive, the ex investment committee and the trustees then regularly turn our minds to, I think would be negligent. Well, and I think um, it is a logical extension of that, that if, you, if we're going to say it as part of our beliefs, then we have to revisit it and measure it. And so resolution two would stand, which is that um, you would receive an annual update from the investment committee on the implications and how it's been Im implemented. Resolution three, uh, about uh, the strategic side, which is um, that climate change risks and opportunities should be formally incorporated into the fund's investment process through strategic reviews. How do we correctly assess the risks of uh, divesting from one particular sector as compared with the risks of the positive risks of investing in a positive new sector? I think our asset consultant ought to be able to uh, at least enumerate the, the likely risks and opportunities here from the literature, a review of the literature would enable, you know, an intelligent review. Yeah, I'd be concerned if, if we saw this again as a reason to go and put on a whole lot of new staff or that sort of thing and took a hit to our MER. So you're telling me, Cathy, you want a solution that is A, cheap, B, has no implications that are negative for short-term performance? Hmm. I think that's very hard to deliver. Wow. I think if, if we are to do our job that's properly right. and give you a solid thesis upon which you can rest and say, yes, I understand this, I will now make a decision, then it will come, I believe, at those two costs. Short-term underperformance, not necessarily, but maybe, and some extra loading on the MER. Sorry about that, but we're not trying to build an empire here, we're simply trying to deliver you the best material. Yeah, I think the best way forward is to identify what are the skill sets lacking internally to be able to carry out the policy. And when I agree with John that clearly uh, there is a chance of short-term underperformance, there's an equal chance of short-term overperformance. All we're talking about here is a differentiation from what might be regarded as a sort of average asset allocation across the industry or across our competitors that we might be somewhat different. It's not simply a risk, there are opportunities. Uh, and they're not necessarily inconsistent. Um, with the social benefit. In the, they ought, in a rational world, to be the same. Mm. I agree I, the world's not rational, by the way. <laughs> We've got a fundamental world. difference on this point, Jeff. If you keep get, getting stuck <laughs> in that groove, we're going to have a very boring and monotonous discussion because there is nothing, I've seen nothing from any source, that indicates there is a greater probability of underperformance if we build these things in. There is at least a theoretical chance of outperformance. Mm. I've seen nothing to say there's the likelihood of underperformance. So what's important is, as a fund, most of our members are going to be with us for a 60-year journey. So when we look at these asset allocations and investments into the future, we need to be not only cognizant of the returns in the short term, but the long term. And some of these assets that we're currently invested in, in the long term, are going to be an impact on our returns. I think that the whole discussion has been an investment discussion and it's been about a, the fact that we're long-term investors but not I'm not accepting the short-term loss um, 
about the fact that we re do have to orient our portfolio because regulators around the world are putting a price on carbon. And that's the issue. And abatement is still where the world is going. And if people are going to make it more expensive to be in carbon emitting industries, then our capacity to make money out of those industries is reducing. And we have to be in other industries if we want to be in the energy and water and those sort of sectors. That's I thought that was a discussion that we've been having. So perhaps if we move on and have a discussion of um, what's proposed as resolution four, uh, which is that the investment committee address the constraints and implications of a two degree global carbon budget, um, regulatory change and the physical impacts of the climate change in implementing the investment policy. Now, I think the key thing about the two degree is it's clearly just a device that's been uh, developed by the scientific community to try and put a time frame around the, the urgency um, uh, of ac action on, on greenhouse gas abatement. What is necessary to get from that is that it's now becoming urgent and there is the chance for quite significant swings in, uh, in global trading policy, economic policy and the like. I think the only thing you can say about political risk is it's ever present and it's probably you know, one of the greatest risks for investment in a lot of these areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, investment in power station, any type, coal driven, heaven forbid, gas or uh, wind or solar require very long time horizons, very long time horizons. And we have, you know, a, a political stability horizon of about two weeks, uh, it seems to me. But there's risk in doing nothing too. You, you, you have exactly the same problem uh, if you do nothing because that implies a certain set of beliefs. And as long as the focus is on um, investment performance and how by taking um, these actions um, we believe and we're doing it because we believe we're going to have an advantage over our competitors um, because we're ahead of the game. Okay well we'll um, move on to the investment allocation resolution number five um, that the investment committee seek low carbon investments on an appropriate risk for return basis and consistent with the investment strategy. I think two big issues are raised by this. One is uh, the, the question of uh, asset allocation, so uh, in broad sectoral terms, not just investment class but also sectoral terms, uh, asset allocation, how we tilt uh, in favour of lower carbon or tilt away, as John says, from higher carbon greenhouse risk. Um, and then the, the next, the other question is actual asset selection and that brings with it an implication of a much more direct approach to investing and uh, we need to work out with the help of our consultant and, and our executive how we might logically approach both those questions of, lo of direct investment and asset class tilting because mm. there's many, many ways we can go about that. Well, I think that comes back to the fundamental question though, doesn't it? Because if what we're saying is we've got an expected return and re volatility appetite within each asset class and we're tilting within those asset classes, then, then they're set. And, and really you're just saying, you know, you're swapping an apple for a pear and the pear's are low carbon and that's fine, that sits within the asset class. And that's as I envisage it happening. If, if you could tilt and there was no evidence or likelihood that that would be a worse investment decision, would you? I would. Yeah, I would too. So that's enough. I think that's sufficient for the, to guide us. You know, we, we, we are not looking to, to tilt our portfolio in ways that will lose us money compared to the alternative. We're looking to tilt in ways that will abate carbon and hopefully make us long-term outperformers. Let's not forget our members in this debate. I've already seen um, Frank's third filing cabinet full of letters from members angry about issues such as tobacco and nuclear armaments and the rest, I'm sure there'll be a lot of letters around climate change over time and we need to be sensitive to what it is the members are asking for and listen to that very carefully. So let's move on to resolution six, which is on measurement, um, which is that the investment committee should adopt a methodology for measuring the fund's exposure to climate change risk. So maybe we need to 
in the light of our thinking about <laughs> climate change, review all of our investment managers and see which are friendly to what we're trying to achieve and which are not, and make some cold, hard decisions on that basis about who to retain and who to get rid of. But to your original point, the ones who are friendly to the enterprise will, I'm sure, overwhelm us with measurements, statistics and facts about exposures to different assets in the existing or prospective portfolio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I certainly support this resolution. I think it's very important if we're um, going to make the changes that we've developed some level of comfort around um, prior to this resolution, then measuring the risk is absolutely fundamental, I think, to us doing it effectively um, and making sure that, that member returns aren't adversely impacted, or if they are, that we make some changes pretty quick. Yep, correct. This will be a surprise to our current members. We really communicate the fact that we belong to various associations and groups like the UNPRI, the IGCC, the Carbon Disclosure Project. So members know that we are involved. What we're doing now is taking it one more step further. We've got to make it clear to our members that we are doing something or about to do something with the portfolio and bring them with us with our vision of action. I think we need to be pretty clear on this. Like B is saying that we are going to make it clear to the members, we're going to publish metrics on climate change and carbon intensity at whole of fund and asset class level. So are we confident you can do it, as you say, in a simple and easily implementable way? And as you say, in a way is not, you know, sort of committing yourself to, to publishing things that you end up finding impossible. Like, can, can we do this? Are there such things, such metrics? Well, I think if you, I think if you can't, if you've got a policy that you can't measure, you probably haven't put enough thought into the policy. Uh, I think you have to have a policy that you can actually measure, and of course, all measurement is you know make some assumptions. I, I agree with Gary on that point. In that, if we're if we're doing this, what we're being asked to agree to today, then <coughs> we have conviction that this is going to lead to opportunity, investment opportunity for our members. Um, I must admit I still am slightly sceptical on that point, but I, I'm sensing a, a degree of, um, of comfort around the rest of the board that that, that is something that, that they're more comfortable about. But my view on communication is if that is the approach we're going to take today, then let's make it very clear to our members that that is what we're doing and we're doing it for the reason of because we think it will impact their long-term returns. And let's see it as a marketing opportunity as well, point of differentiation with all of those other vanilla funds that you know, where we've always 0.4 or 5% um, you know, within um, you know, performance yeah. of every month when we look at the figures. Um, let's see this as an opportunity to do something different. Good. Yeah, yeah. OK. Well, I think that's a very positive note to, in fact, finish on. I think you've summed that up. Um, very nicely, Jeff, and we've come to the end of our discussion on all of these resolutions. And apart from one insertion of the word anticipated in resolution four, um, there's been no suggestions of, of changing the resolutions. Um, so can I put it to the board? Are we happy to, to um, pass this set suite of resolutions and um, set the investment committee and our CIO and our CEO uh, the task of making our fund more responsible and active around the issue of climate change. All in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Thank you.